we've been experimenting with the BMI problem now a little bit with linear regression. And what we found was that we quite dramatically overfit uh, the, the data set when we have a really tiny data set. In particular, that's the least mean squares algorithm uh, that does this. We've also talked about some regularization methods that try to achieve a balance between explaining the training data and achieving some simplicity in the model that we have constructed. And the hope is that by achieving that simplicity, that the resulting model will be more applicable to the, the wider data set that is out there in the world. Let's go ahead and try using now these regularization methods with our BMI data and get a better sense of how they operate. We'll do a little bit of comparison between the different methods. So for this example, I've started a new Jupyter notebook. Uh, the pieces are essentially the same as what we have done with linear regression with the BMI data. Uh, so it should all look uh, very familiar. So there's all of our imports. We have some code that's all about reading uh, the data for us, reading file set. And then we also created this my eval uh, function uh, not too long ago, I'm, I've imported that as well. And I'm uh, loading, of course, all of the folds that are available to us. As we've been doing uh, in the past, I'm going to focus on using fold zero uh, for the training data, and then we'll use fold one as the independent uh, data set. So, so here I'm selecting uh, fold zero, and we're going to focus on the position data and the zeroth column, which is the, the shoulder position. So, so this code here is, is all about building that linear regression model. We've, we've done this before, but I, I wanted to remind uh, ourselves uh, how poorly uh, the linear regression model actually does with this data set configuration. So let's go ahead and create that model and use it to predict on the training set. And then this segment here is, uh, is where we're selecting fold one for our independent data set and uh, doing prediction using the existing model uh, on those inputs and then comparing the desired output uh, to the predicted uh, values. So let's execute that. Okay, so, so my eval, this last number here, this is root mean squared error in degrees, which is 13.5. That's a fairly sizable uh, error for uh, predicting position uh, of a, one of the, the joints uh, on this robot and, and with the monkey as well. But let's go ahead and look at uh, a small time window here. So we're going to uh, plot the actual positions in red, the predicted values in, in green. Execute that. And, and there's our our curve. And we've, and we've seen similar curves uh, already. The key here is that uh, although if we squint, the green curve does nominally track the, the, the trend of the red curve, but, but uh, it deviates quite a bit. And, and in particular, uh, there's some really high frequency components uh, to the, the signal that's encoded in the green curve here. And, and if we're imagining taking this position estimate and using it as an input to a control system for a robotic prosthesis, uh, this could end up uh, giving us uh, some really poor performance on that, uh, on that arm. And in particular, we could end up with a very chattery kind of uh, behavior out of the arm. So, so we'd like to be able to do better. And, and better can mean a couple of different things here. Uh, one is we'd really like to track that red curve better. So, so we want green. To, to match red uh, better. So we want that root mean squared error to go down. And then the other thing is that we want to reduce that high frequency uh, component to the green uh, curve. And, and the idea behind these regularization techniques that we've been studying is to attack both of these kinds of problems. Okay, so I have, I have some code already uh, in place here for ridge regression. You've, you've already seen us use ridge regression in the very simple uh, case. Uh, I, I'm starting out with an alpha of, uh, of one for our regularization parameter. 
there's our fit, and then we're using that learned model to predict both uh, based on the training inputs as well as the inputs for the independent data set. And, and then we're going to evaluate uh, the difference between uh, the, the true, the ground truth uh, position and the predictions that are made uh, by this ridge regression model. So let's execute that. And one thing to note here is that our root mean squared error has dropped by one degree. So that's, so that's a small improvement. But let's look, go ahead and look at the time series here. And that is uh, this code. So I'm, I'm going to keep the green curve, which is our LMS uh, solution, but now introduce a third curve, which will be in blue. And that's our ridge regression uh, prediction. OK, so, so what? you'll notice is that uh, the blue curve actually tracks the, uh, the green curve quite well. Where it deviates is, uh, is in the, the peaks either on the high end or the low end. The, the blue curve does not extend quite as high or quite as low uh, as the green curve. So, so we're starting to smooth out the, the curve a tiny bit, but it, we're still a very big difference uh, um, there's still a very big difference in our predictions from the red curve. So, so the next natural thing to do is, is to start to work with this hyperparameter. And, and when we're working with, uh, with a, a new data set and a, and a model, it's not atypical for us to, to do a very coarse level uh, sampling of the hyperparameters. I like to work in, in uh, factors of 10 uh, other people work in factors of two. It, it's really uh, about preference. As we start to home in on better parameters, we might use a finer granularity. Uh, but as, especially for regularization parameters, factors of 10, I think, work quite well. So, so let's go ahead and, and build a new ridge regression model. And uh, the, so I executed that. The, the next thing to notice is that our root mean squared error has dropped to 10. And let's look at how that has improved things. So overall, that blue curve is starting to compress uh, down uh, closer to a little bit closer to the red curve. Uh, so there are places, uh, so such as here, where the blue curve um, we've we've eliminated some of the high frequency components. So that double peak there is now uh, has now been removed. It's been smoothed out to a single peak. Uh, and likewise, on the other side, uh, we have more of a, a smoother uh, curve for blue, whereas for the, the green curve, you kind of have that funny plateau right in that vicinity there. Um, but, but then now for, for the highs and the lows, we've got some pretty substantial differences between the blue and the green curve. Still far away from where we want to be, uh, but let's, let's try out the next uh, order of magnitude here. So I'm going to go to... Uh, 100. Execute that. Our root mean squared error now is down to 7.4. And and uh, take a look at that. So so the blue curve now one one could argue is starting to capture the uh, the trends of the red curve reasonably well. We're still not tracking it exactly, but, but we are capturing the trends. And it's also a lot smoother than the, the blue curve. The, a lot of the high frequency components have either been removed or substantially muted. So let's, let's go another, another bit here. So now our root mean squared error has dropped to 6.8. And let's look at how that changes our figure. And from a smoothness perspective, that blue curve now is doing a, a very nice job as far as capturing the, 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 the frequencies that we see in the, the red curve, uh, much more so than the frequencies that we see in the green curve. So, it's, so we're, we're still, there are times where we're, we're tracking that red curve quite well, but then there are other times where we're starting to, uh, where we're deviating. So here, one of those places where we're deviating. But, this section here, the section here, where the blue curve is actually tracking red quite well. 
Let's go another order of magnitude just to see where that takes us. So you'll notice that our root mean squared error now has gone up to 9.4. And let's plot that. So what's, what's happening here, um, the blue curve is uh, smoother. What we're starting to see is that the, the magnitude uh, of the blue curve, either in the positive direction, essentially above this 0.25 or below this 0.25, that, that range is starting to uh, compress uh, a bit. And uh, as we continue to increase this regularization parameter, we're going to be asking for shallower and shallower coefficients. Uh, and we'll, we're going to really be, cease to track the, the red curve very well. We might get the general trends but the magnitude, we're, we're going to start to deviate quite a bit. So let's take another step along that direction. So now we're at, uh, at 100,000. And you'll notice now our error is back up to about where we were uh, with the green curve. The green curve was at like 13.5. And, and you can see now uh, the, the range of the blue curve is very small. Uh, relative to the, the range that we really want, uh, which is what the, the red curve is showing us. So, so the point here is that there is this sweet spot in uh, a cho the choice of the regularization parameter. Uh, if it's uh, too small, then we're not smoothing enough. Uh, and, and, and we end up, in this case, because we're overfitting uh, with very high frequency kinds of components, and uh, as we increase the regularization parameter, uh, we start to smooth things out so that we're really capturing the frequencies of the true signal. Uh, and then as we continue to increase the, the regularization parameter beyond that, we're actually starting to suppress the, the interesting frequencies that really correspond to natural reaching with, with, these, uh, with these monkey subjects. So I, I'm gonna drop back just for fun, I actually played with this a bit beforehand. Uh, if you remember, somewhere in the 100 to 1,000 range is probably pretty good. Um, I, here, here's 500. We're back down to that 6.7 root mean squared error. And, and, and here, the, the blue curve is, is tracking the red curve uh, pretty well. There, there are some some higher frequency components uh, hiding in here. So maybe, maybe we really do want uh, that regularization parameter to be up around 1,000 or so. But, uh, but we're doing a reasonable job here. And, and as we've seen before, we can also combine this technique uh, with the technique of adding more training data to try and uh, achieve a model that uh, will work uh, better. So that'll be. Uh, coming up here in a homework assignment soon. Okay, so let's go ahead and try out the lasso uh, learning algorithm here. And if you recall, instead of using the sum squared coefficients, we're using some absolute value uh, coefficients as our regularization term here. Uh, so here's the code for doing this. The, really the only thing that has changed is that we're invoking a different class, which happens to be called lasso. The, the other thing to notice is that this regularization parameter uh, alpha is quite a bit smaller than what we ended up choosing for, uh, for the ridge regression. And, and that just comes from the fact that really we're comparing apples and oranges here. Uh, squared coefficients versus absolute coefficients are, are really operating in different ranges here. Um, that said, I'm kind of starting at the low range for, for an alpha value here. So, so we're doing just as we did before. We're creating the model, we're fitting it. Uh, we're asking to make predictions based on the training set and our independent data set, and then calling my eval uh, using these uh, predictions from the lasso model. So let's go ahead and execute that. And we're at a root mean squared error of 10.3, which is not so bad. Um, let's go ahead and draw the, uh, the figure here. Uh, really the only difference here is that we now have our lasso output uh, that, that we're plotting 
and we're keeping our LMS uh, solution as well. So let's execute that. And, and here the, the story is very similar to what we uh, saw with the ridge regression uh, with this very small uh, alpha the blue curve is actually tracking the green curve pretty well. We're, we're already starting to cut away from the, the high frequency components, uh, but, uh, but we haven't made a substantial step there yet. Okay, so, so let's try increasing our regularization parameter. So now we're at 10 to the minus three as opposed to 10 to the minus four. Let me execute that. And, and now we're down at 7.2 root mean squared error, and that's in degrees. And if you recall, we, we achieved something in the order of 6.7 with the ridge regression. Uh, and at th for this particular choice of parameters, uh, we're actually starting to track the, the red curve to a reasonable degree. Uh, there are still some substantial deviations, and, and we still have some higher frequency components here, but it's certainly not uh, to the degree that the green curve was uh, giving us. So let's go another one more order of magnitude here. And now we're at 8.7, which is a, a little bit higher. We've now gone back up. Uh, the blue curve is doing at least in this region that we were staring at before, the blue curve is doing a reasonable job of tracking red. It's doing better, uh, but it's certainly, it certainly seems to be undershooting uh, in several key locations. We still also have some of the higher frequency components. It still is a pretty jagged, uh, a jagged curve, um, which is sort of undesirable, again, from the control perspective. So, so really that sweet spot for, for this parameter, we can, we can, for fun, we can go to uh, another order of magnitude up. We're now at 14.3, uh, which is about what LMS was giving us before. And you can see now we've, uh, we're have essentially down to predicting uh, a constant function, which is not terribly interesting. So, so that sweet spot seems to be somewhere uh, perhaps at 0 0.02 or somewhere around in that vicinity, there's a, a seven degree root mean squared error. That's uh, not all that different than what we were seeing with 0 0.001. Okay, so I, I do want to make a point about uh, the coefficients and, and the differences in what we see with ridge regression versus what we see with lasso. So let's go ahead and build uh, a, uh, some figures here. We're going we're gonna to look at a list of coefficients and plot a histogram. So we've talked about the differences between these different algorithms, the least mean squared algorithm versus ridge regression versus lasso. We'll look at elastic net here in a moment. Um, but one of the key differences is the types of choices that get made uh, as far as the coefficients go. And, and so I'd like to look for a moment at uh, what we get for coefficients uh, for these models. If you recall, we have uh, a total of 960 features, so we have 961 coefficients. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the histogram of those coefficient values. Um, so here's the code for for that, uh, so our, we're using our hist function. This accesses all of the coefficients inside of the LMS-based model that we've constructed, and I'm asking for a total of 21 bins there. So executing that, um, what we're ending up with is actually a, a very nicely normal, normally distributed uh, uh, set of uh, uh, coefficients, and there's the mean is somewhere very close to, to zero, which is what I would hope for in this uh, scenario. Um, you'll notice that there is a tiny bit of a tail uh, out on the positive side as well as on the negative side. But nominally, the interesting stuff is going on in the plus minus 
0.05 range. So this is what LMS gives us. Let's ask the question, and, and this is the scenario where we were overfitting our data. Let's also ask the question not of LMS, but let's also ask uh, the ridge model. So this is the ridge regression uh, coefficients. And, and here, so for, first off, we are, uh, we have again, something that's sort of normally distributed. The tail might be a little bit, uh, a little bit heavier than a, a normal distribution, uh, but we still have something that's nominally normal, nominally centered around zero. Um, but one striking thing in looking at this figure is that the range of our uh, coefficients is, is really uh, the, the interesting stuff is going on in the 0.01 to negative 0.01 range. And compare that against what the LMS solution was, which was more on the order of plus minus 0.05. So, so our distribution is, is actually quite a bit narrower in the ridge regression case than our, uh, than our LMS case. And, and, and this matches our intuition because the way we formulated ridge regression is that we're punishing large coefficients. Okay, so that's LMS and ridge. Let's also look at what the lasso model does. So there's the code to look at that histogram. Think about what lasso tries to achieve and, and what we noticed in our simple example that we did in the last video. Um, there's our distribution. And really the, the, the striking thing about this distribution is that we have a tremendous number of uh, coefficients that are sitting uh, right around zero. And in fact, they are sitting at exactly zero. So, so we talked before about how the ridge regression model uh, with its L2 norm is what we call it, where we're squaring the coefficients and taking a sum over those. Uh, that likes to make small coefficients, but it doesn't necessarily want to make them zero. In contrast, this L1 norm, uh, meaning that we're taking the absolute value of the coefficients and, and the sum of those, uh, this actually wants to set as many of the coefficients as it can to zero while still explaining the data to some degree. And, and of course that alpha parameter will, will uh, allow us to set some balance between how many we set to zero uh, versus how many get values that are, uh, that are non-zero. Uh, the tail on, on this, where the, the range has increased. Um, so, so we are uh, back to, uh, actually, actually we're, we're in the vicinity of what our ridge regression was doing. So ridge was plus minus 0.01. Maybe if we squint, we're sort of plus minus 0.02, uh, but the, the, the mass of uh, the distribution is definitely sitting right here at, uh, at zero. Okay, so let's now take a look at elastic nets. And if you recall, uh, the elastic net sort of tries to walk the balance between ridge regression and, uh, and lasso uh, in that it includes components that are both L2 and uh, L1. So here's our code to, to do that. The, the difference is that we, we do have a regularization parameter as we had with ridge and with lasso but now we have another parameter uh, that necessarily sits between zero and one uh, that uh, tells us what the balance is between that L2 part of the uh, regularization term and the L1 part of the regularization term. Let's go ahead and execute this. So think about that. Um, with this particular choice, we're sitting at a 13.2 for, for our root mean squared error which is not all that impressive. Uh, let's go ahead and look at what we, 
uh, what, what the curve looks like. Again, we will have this reference of LMS as in green. Okay, so, so we don't actually see green here because blue is exactly covering up green. Uh, maybe, actually, if you squint, there are a few pixels of green up at the, the peaks here. So, so what this says is that our regularization term is, uh, is not high enough. So let's go, let's change by an order of magnitude. So now we're at 10 to the minus four. And now you'll, you'll notice that our root mean squared error is, uh, is a little bit smaller. Um, one other thing to, to note is that every time I go to execute this, this is actually taking a noticeable amount of time as compared to ridge regression. Uh, and, and that's because we're actually engaged in a certain degree of search. Uh, because of that L1 component, we see this with, with Lasso as well, there's actually a search that asks the question of, do I set a coefficient to exactly zero or, or do I set it to something other than zero? And if it's something other than zero, then, uh, then we have to go through the math of solving for the optimal value. All right, let's look at the curve. And you'll notice with this slightly higher regularization parameter, now blue is starting to deviate from green. So let's continue our, our search here, now 10 to the minus three. And our error now is starting to get down to where we like it, 7.8 there. And, and now blue is, is starting to track red a little bit better than, uh, than green was. We're starting to take care of some of those big high frequency terms. Um, there's still some variation, whereas uh, the red is, is actually a nice smooth curve. So let's go another order of magnitude here. Now we're down to 7.5. It's a small change, not a huge one. And that blue curve now is, is starting to, to track red fairly well. Um, just for fun, let's go for another order of magnitude. And, and you'll notice our error now has started to go back up. So we're sort of at our, uh, at our limits here. And, and you can see now uh, the blue curve, the, the range of the blue curve is actually uh, quite a bit smaller than that of the red curve. And if we continue to increase this regularization parameter, the blue curve would do, as we saw before, uh, it, it would tend toward a, a constant output. So probably the favorite uh, coefficient here is something on the order of uh, 0.02 or somewhere around there. So we're at 7.2 for root mean squared error. And, and that's, that's not so bad of an answer. Our ridge regression model, we were able to get down a little bit more, but we also have to ask the question of whether or not these differences are really statistically different from one another. And that's an answer that we can't uh, we, we can't conjure with just one sample here. Okay, then the final thing that, that we have to, to do here is let's actually look at the, the coefficients. So there's our histogram here. And, and you'll notice the distribution actually is not all that different than what we were seeing with the, with the lasso algorithm. We, we have this, this very big peak that sits, that should be right at zero how it drew the bins, it's a little bit unclear, but uh, it's probably the case that zero is, is included in this large bin here. Um, but we're still nominally sitting in plus minus 0.01 and definitely within plus, plus minus 0.02. Um, we could play some with uh, changing of the, the balance, um, in, in which case uh, what we probably would want to, to do is change uh, this ratio here, and then one would have to adjust the alpha to, to an appropriate level. Um, recall that the ridge regression alpha and the lasso regression alphas were very different in terms of their, uh, their relative magnitude. And, and so as we change that balance, we, we, we'd have to probably make changes to this alpha. I'm going to leave that one uh, for, to you as, as an exercise. Okay, so Hopefully you're coming away from this with an appreciation for what 
regularization can do for us in terms of constructing uh, smoother models, models that do a better job of uh, not overfitting the small training sets that we have, but instead uh, are capturing more of the general trends that actually extend beyond just this data set uh, that we have. We, we can also combat this overfitting uh, as we've shown a little bit uh, by adding more training data and, and actually this combination of regularization and more training data, if, if we have the training data available uh, to us, uh, that combination of tools uh, can help us a lot in, in terms of even improving the models beyond what we've been able to do here. In, in practice, this one fold of, of training data or one or two folds, this is where we kind of like to be as practitioners in the brain machine interface domain. And, that, and that's because we, we don't want to have to have, a, uh, say an amputee, have to do lots of practice uh, before they can actually use their uh, prosthetic arm. Uh, uh, but uh, what, what we'll see as we move forward, especially in your next homework assignment, uh, is, is, is that uh, bringing more training data to the table actually can improve things quite a bit.